to yet another edition of our Zoom with a Missionary. Um, my name is Jen Bagnall, and I am the Director of Public Relations for the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. And we started up Zoom with a Missionary purely as an opportunity to come back to you and to say thank you so much for your gifts, for your prayers. And um, this is an opportunity for you to have hear um, directly from somebody who uses our LHF materials all the time and can personally attest to the value of the work that you're supporting. And I think um, our guest today actually has, um, all of our guests are just very good, but um, Reverend Horpachek from uh, the Ukrainian Lutheran Church has, uh, I think, a unique insight into just how valuable it is to have a book in your hands um, that teaches about Jesus. I'll let Reverend Benkendorf, you go ahead and take her away. All right. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate it. Glad to see everybody, or at least see some names down there of people and some faces, um, as Reverend Horpencheck and I talk today. Um, Reverend Horpencheck is actually located in the Ukraine right now, so this is this is really cool for us to be able to do this. This is just really amazing. Um, Reverend Horpencheck serves as pastor at Resurrection Lutheran Church. That's correct, right? Resurrection? Yes, that's absolutely right. Yep. So at Resurrection Lutheran Church, and he is the bishop of the Ukrainian Lutheran Church, which is right now in fellowship with the Wisconsin Synod. So, so good, solid Lutheran theology across the board here. So um, our normal way of doing this is I just kind of have a list of, of questions and topics that I go over with the missionary. But in, in talking with Reverend Horpinchuk and knowing him previously, he has an amazing story of kind of how he's gotten where he is and how things have gone in the Ukraine. And um, Reverend Horpinchuk tells a great story as well. So um, we're going to kind of go from the very beginning with all of this, and I'm just going to open it up to you and, and tell your stories. I might interrupt you every once in a while and ask a question or emphasize something, but otherwise I'm going to start with this question, sir. What was it like as a child growing up in the Ukraine under communism? What was your experience in a Christian family, right? Yes, that's, that's right. Well, uh, the Soviet Union was uh, a very anti-God state. Its official policy was militant atheism, which meant uh, not only uh, separation of church and school, as they thought it should be, but also an attack on church and God uh, in all possible ways. One of the possible ways, as the, the communists saw, was to forbid all attendance uh, of churches by small children, and also to forbid uh, any publication of the Bibles. Just imagine. In the Soviet Union, they had a population of, of 300 million people. They published uh, 100,000 Bibles. That was, that was it, and that was uh, connected uh, to 1,000th anniversary of uh, baptism of Rus, you know, which was uh, basically like, like a good gesture shown by the communists to, uh, to the world, not so to Ukrainian uh, Christians. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a very dark uh, period in the life of Ukraine, because uh, people were really uh, cut away from the public worship. The public worship was held usually at homes. And uh, uh, at those homes where you could, uh, uh, where the Christian faith was still preserved. I was uh, lucky that my grandfather was the president of the local congregation. He had the Bible, he had some Christian books, and uh, he was uh, also doing his best to make sure that his uh, grandchildren like me, my brothers, my, uh, my cousins, would listen to the word of God on radio and also read the Bible at his home. Uh, you know, it's, it, it was almost impossible uh, to get to that book because he was treasuring uh, the, his Bible very strongly. You need to get into his home to ask his permission and then he would uh, give you to read. And if you're a small boy, you would uh, read it slowly. Uh, <laughs> plus it was in Russian, you know, it was not in Ukrainian. Oh. because uh, they wouldn't allow publication of the Bibles in uh, your language. It was, wow. uh, it was this, uh, this also official policy of the uh, Soviet Union to make sure that all people switch to Russian eventually. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it was language we understood and uh, we wanted to have that, uh, that book at our home. What do you do? Can you copy it? No, you don't have copying machines, even uh, especially at that time. But you have your pen and you have your uh, notebook 
And that's what uh, my grandfather and my godmother would, uh, would uh, suggest me to do. You take your thick, I, I remember still very well, thick red notebook, come to uh, my grandfather's home, take your pen and uh, carefully write down verses from the Bible and uh, sometimes from the prayer books, you know, that, that were also at his home. And in such a way, you would have such a small Bible uh, in your notebook. Uh, you wouldn't be able to copy all the book. It would be uh, too long and it would be a very hard labor, but you would have at least some words, some chapters, some you know things that uh, are really good, some psalms uh, to pray, some, uh, some uh, what we call golden verses like uh, John 3.16 and other nice, nice words. And in such a way, you would have the word of God with you. Plus, if uh, there would be, uh, you know, an attack on your home, if, uh, uh, if a search uh, company from KGB comes, you know, uh, they would uh, lose a lot of time to go through all children's notebooks. And we had three boys at our home, <laughs> so they wouldn't probably, wouldn't probably do it. It was an easy way to hide it and to mask it. And you could even sometimes take it uh, to your school, which was also very atheistic because, again, Milton atheism was an official policy of the Soviet Union. Uh, I, uh, you know, when I was a small boy, I once I took a book uh, without permission with children's or Bible stories from my uh, grandfather's home and it was confiscated. So after that, after that, I had even stricter policies. So I'm curious, when you talk about the golden verses, did, did your grandfather or your godmother or some other adult kind of point those out to you or how did, how did those come to the forefront? Yes. Uh, uh, go, my uh, my godfather was especially good at that. Uh, my grandfather would uh, show us more to psalms, and and she would uh, show us to 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 words uh, of the gospel more strongly. <laughs> awesome, so, and, very and, good, wise lady. And and that's that's the positive that you had that opportunity because obviously that's unique. I mean, other other children certainly didn't have that. So you grew up with that. Um, what, what were what were some of the uh, maybe a, a negative experience that you'd be willing to share um, with regard to being under communism and family life? Uh, well, uh, one of that would uh, be uh, no possibility to go to worship, to worship at the church at church uh, when uh, there would be a holiday or Sunday, and uh, we would like to come to church, especially when you're a, a schoolboy, a student then you would have to somehow to slip through the police cordon. You know, police uh, or KGB people would stand around the church uh, with some uh, faithful uh, uh, teachers. By faithful teachers, I mean faithful to the communist uh, uh, anti-God dogma. And they would also register those children that would, uh, would come to church and uh, or would, like, would like to come to church, but certainly would not be allowed. Uh, that this is one of the things. Uh, the second thing would be uh, no possibility to share uh, the word of God with uh, other students, you know, in your classroom. We had uh, a couple of uh, Christian uh, uh, children, uh, some uh, were Protestants, some were Orthodox, and we certainly knew each other. But if uh, someone would uh, hear such a talk, uh, oh, you would have a problem. Uh, and the problem could be as severe as to separate children from uh, parents. Uh, to send uh, children into what they called internat, or basically it was an orphanage where they would take a special care to make sure that a child would forget uh, what they called indoctrination of the church. It was, it was in my time, and I do remember that very clearly, that was this fear uh, that was uh, present uh, both uh, at, uh, in the street and at school. And uh, we remember it very well how some children were taken away from their homes and sent to such internats. It was a cruel, uh, a cruel system. If when the country forgets God, very soon such uh, things uh, begin. And uh, the Soviet Union was one of the worst uh, examples in treating uh, God's children uh, in such a way. Uh, well, uh, but you know, we had, we had, again, my grandfather was a hardworking man. He would wake at 5 a.m. on Sunday and uh, would wake us all, he would, we lived in the neighborhood, take us to his home uh, at that early hour, uh, turn on his old uh, radio, which was called Muramets, you know, this old lamp radio, 
and would uh, make us to listen to all possible uh, all possible programs with the with preaching of the word of God. Didn't matter even what denomination it was. That was a, that was that was proper, and that was uh, that was a must to be to do uh, on Sunday. And he would make sure that we do it. Then we then those programs would be over like at uh, 8 a.m. And then he would go to church, open the church, and have the public worship there, uh, service there. Uh, so if I can interrupt you then. So as, as I, I know, being an American boy, <laughs> that, that getting up at 5 a.m. would not have been something I would have enjoyed doing. I mean, was it so understood, though? I mean, the lines were drawn, obviously. So you understood that this was important, and for the sake of, of God, this is why we do this? Or did you kind of grumble a little bit at that 5 a.m. wake-up call? Oh, sometimes I'd grumble when I was <laughs> very tired. I have to be honest, but but uh, then you know, you know, it's the only way to listen to the word of God, uh, and uh, and uh, you would go go and do it. Plus, it was illegal, also, so it was not legal. You should understand that that they were trying to limit uh, all your listening to the word of God and to any radio broadcast from the West uh, would be would be treated by the communists as a treason. And if uh, you'd be caught even listening to a radio program from the West, it doesn't matter what kind of program, uh, whether it's a political program or uh, the worship uh, of God, the uh, preaching, you know, sermon, uh, they would uh, they would uh, call you to the KGB and you could be sentenced uh, to go into, into prison. And again, there was always a risk of separation of the family, especially if uh, you would take uh, children or grandchildren and uh, making sure that they listen to the word of God. All things were illegal, but even that, even uh, with that, uh, you know, they had the special, uh, special, uh, powerful um, towers when they would make uh, all kind of uh, all kind of obstacles uh, to radio programs. And we were told by by radio speakers, if you cannot hear on wave twenty five, then turn to wave thirty one or turn to wave uh, forty seven, and then. Then you'll find us there. So change your waves and uh, and uh, don't don't lose your hope. Listen to the word of God. That, that is that, awesome. That, that was life. That that, that actually kind of leads in uh, to where I'm thinking here next. So so this was in your. So by the time you hit your teenage years, were you still doing this in your family, or had things changed, or where where how did life move on for you? Well, uh, teen you know uh, uh, teenager years are always difficult because you uh, you always uh, protest and we know it from uh, from uh, our children and from our families. Uh, I think uh, I would uh, I would uh, go less uh, to my grandfather. Instead, I bought my own radio, so I had oh. one had one at <laughs> home, and uh, and would uh, listen listen at my home. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, I think. Uh, there was less uh, less of uh, of uh, my grandfather's uh, influence upon me, uh, but more of uh, influence of other people that would uh, say, you know, that we should uh, should have the Bible anyway. And I was uh, looking for my uh, for my Bible. Unfortunately, I was not able to find it uh, till I was uh, 22 years old. Wow! You, so you never had a copy of the Bible bound until you were 22. That's right. I'll show you the Bible that uh, my first Bible in my life. <laughs> I got goosebumps. That is that is really cool. Well, it's it's, it's in English. I do saw know, that. Do you, want, do you want to hear the story? Please, of course. <laughs> my uh, my uh, my. I visit my uh, my brother. He was an engineer. He lived in Rimne, and uh, and you know. They knew I was looking for uh, for the churches and and for the Bible for the Word of God. Plus, I was in the anti-communist uh, uh, underground society. Uh, we were specialized, so to say, in restoration of uh, churches and in making sure that uh, old Christian monuments uh, will be restored and to remind people that we are a Christian people, a Christian nation. And when I was uh, visiting my brother, he told me, "Slavik, do you want to have the Bible?" I said, "Of course, I do." What, whatever could be done, I'll, I'll, you know, I have, I have my uh, money. I was still a student at the university. I just, uh, you know, returned from the army, and he told me, well, I have this guy, and he's, uh, you know, he is a smuggler. He's a smuggler. He's from Poland. He smuggles the Bibles, and I said, I want to talk to that man. And I, <laughs> I he said, he's my li in my living room. I went into his living room, and uh, and my sister-in-law, she was uh, preparing supper. 
And uh, the guy, uh, he was an older man, he said, told me, take a seat. I took a seat. And then he began to speak in German. And uh, I was a student of German and English. And I uh, began to reply, and then in English, and, uh, and uh, said, oh, I, I see you, you're good at languages. And uh, then I, he said, so what's your purpose to come here? I said, well, I, I need the Bible. I know you sell the Bibles. He said, I have only my personal copy left. All others were sold. I said, I know it's, it's, a, it's a good uh, good thing to sell. And he said, 10 rubles, young man. 10 rubles was one tenth of your salary. So you understand in the Soviet Union. And I said, sure, absolutely. So I gave him uh, 10 rubles and he said, that's in English. I'm sure you'll be able to read it, King James Version. So I, I took the Bible, I kissed it, uh, I crossed it. You know, it was kept dearly at my heart. And, uh, and then we, when we had uh, supper, he said, why don't you leave? I said, this is my brother. I said, oh, if I knew it was your brother, I would make a gift to you. I said to him, it's not too late to return my 10 rubles to me. He said, well, the deal is a deal, you know. <laughs> I'm a smuggler and that's my business. That's right. <laughs> so that was, that was my, but I was so happy. I can't imagine you how happy I was. And then, then I, I uh, was uh, keeping that uh, again, uh, hiding it because it was still the Soviet Union. I was trying to read it every day. I had to use my dictionary, of course, because uh, there were many words that I couldn't, uh, couldn't understand really well. And, uh, but uh, that made a tremendous uh, impact wow. and influence upon me. Uh, wow. because, uh, that, that's a couple of yeah wow um <laughs> just a couple of comments that you sprinkled in there that also explode into ideas um so how difficult was it being a a christian while you were in the military well basically you had to hide your faith very strongly because uh, if you uh, if you confess that you're a christian then uh, they will not really uh, treat you well, but uh, send you to make sure that they uh, change your mind, you know, that right. you change your mind, uh, throw you into, into all kinds, uh, kinds of uh, uh, facilities, uh, re-educational so-called facilities, uh -huh. where you will have to work hard, where you will not have enough sleep. Basically, that will be like sort of a military prison. So uh, you pray, uh, you... Uh, you know, you, uh, you remember all things that, that you learned in your childhood, but you cannot have your personal things. The Soviet army or the Red Army was very, very impersonal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't have any privacy at all. Uh, you know, you live in a barrack and your things uh, are inspected uh, basically daily uh, in your presence or uh, in your absence. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's... It's a very, it was a very, very strict society for several years when you have such a society, you know, you, you, learn, you learn that it's, a, it's better to avoid it, but you cannot avoid it because it was compulsory. Right. Uh, well, you, uh, I had to hide my, my cross, uh, you know, when, uh, when in Ukraine, when a child is uh, baptized, uh, then a child is granted the cross. I had to leave it at home. I said to my brother, keep it. When I returned, uh, then, then I'll take it back. But I always remembered, I was baptized. Uh, I uh, prayed to the Lord uh, whenever I had uh, difficulties, problems. Uh, you know, it's especially, uh, especially helpful. And uh, plus you, you, always, you always come across someone who believes. And uh -huh. I don't know how it happens, but, uh, but you come across a man who would, uh, who would share a Christian faith, you know, wow. and will not betray you. So uh, the Lord was merciful to me, was good to me, and uh, I'm very thankful that he led me through my army years without uh, any problems of, uh, of betrayal on the side of my friends. Wow. Who are Christians. No, well, I, again, so many thoughts going on. We just don't have time for all of them. Um, but uh, so that what I wasn't going to go here earlier, but what you were just saying, how long was, how old were you before you got to regularly participate in public worship then? Because you couldn't do it in your youth, you couldn't do it in the military. I mean, you were without word and sacrament on the weekends, like we call it here in the U.S., for a long time. Oh, not 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 really. Oh, okay. Uh, remember that my godmother, uh, uh, my godmother was a nun. <laughs> so she would, uh, when we were children, she would secretly take us to a convent. Oh. And uh, you know that that that's how that's how uh, you would uh, you would have the Holy Communion. And you remember the words of Luther, of course, they have the Holy Communion. And, uh, and uh, she would take us uh, periodically. Okay. And then, and then uh, the Soviet Union was big. When you're 
older, you can travel to places where they don't know you. The problem with the Soviet Union was that uh, there were many priests. Some were faithful and some were uh, KGB agents. And you never knew uh, whom you come across. Wow. Because if you come to a KGB agent, then, and he knows you, and he knows your name, and he knows your surname, he will report on you. And sooner or later, they will come after you. And wow. uh, then you have problems. Uh, so it would be always good and safe to drive several hundred kilometers away and come to church, which would be open, find an open church. It was also another problem because you could not find an open church in, the, in all, in, in, you know, in many cities, churches were closed. Wow. But if you find one, then you come and then you take, uh, take uh, the Holy Communion because you, you have the word. The question is, where do you take the Holy Communion? That was the hardest the most, uh, the most, uh, the uh, impossible thing, thing to do, and and pray and and uh, you know there would be creed, there would be Lord's prayer, there would be uh, litany, and uh, and uh, that was that was of course a, a real treasure. Once mm -hmm. I was uh, in a situation when we were at church and and I saw a guy who was looked to me like KGB. I, I was certain that that uh, I I saw him. And then my friend told me, well, but what do we lose? He said they took away everything from us anyway. And I agree. I said, yeah, you are right. You know, you're absolutely right. Let's kneel and pray. <laughs> so this is, you know, that, that, that's what you do. That's what you do. Uh, if uh, if uh, you lose uh, your freedom for the sake of Christ, well, we have people, many people who were uh, sent to prison, who were sent uh, into exile. My grandfather, who was a Christian teacher, he was murdered by communists in 1944. And you know, again, for his activities, for his uh, for his Christian faith, we knew sometimes it might happen. And I again, I knew I know uh, several priests who uh, were tortured, who were beaten strongly for their uh, Christian faith. Uh, I know a few deacons. One of them, uh, one of them, uh, still is a deacon in our church in a Lutheran in a Holy Cross Lutheran church in Kremenitz. He's about, uh, I think, 75 years old. Hmm. And, uh, you know, when they were restoring in the Soviet Union, so you will understand that that evil empire, they made a law that would forbid uh, stores and uh, private citizens to sell any construction materials to churches. Basically say, yeah, we allow you to worship, but you are not allowed to repair it, to fix it. So this, uh, this uh, deacon, when he was probably 25 years old, again, he, that was in time of, uh, at the end of Khrushchev era and uh, Brezhnev era, uh, someone donated bricks uh, to the church because there were some problems. And, uh, and then police came, not KGB, but police came to him and interrogated him very severely. Uh, he never betrayed anyone from his church they uh, broke his fingers. He said the worst thing was when they were putting nails on the fingers uh. Uh, and putting your then fingers into between doors. You know, that's, he said that was most painful. <laughs> and then one police major told him that uh, he would uh, rotten him in that dungeon uh, till he dies. Wow. Then, then he said that that's fine. He said, I agreed with that, uh, with that fate. He said when he was in that dungeon, he remembered the uh, uh, fate of uh, Daniel, the prophet. You know, a very inspiring story from the Bible. And then in the morning, he said they let him free. In a month, he said, a, a lady knocked his door early in the morning. Again, he was a deacon. And she said that her husband died. And she wanted uh, him to be, uh, to be buried by this deacon. Because that was the last will of that man. So he had prescription from his bishop to go and bury the man. And he told me, he said, when I came into that house, he said, I was so surprised to see that major police, police major lying, lying in the coffin. And he said, I hope that he, he had, I, I he said, I thought that he, he repented and, it, wow. and he buried him. So his, his sticking by the Christian faith, by the power of the Holy Spirit, made that much of an impression on that major in the police Yes. Wow. To Stand God. Be wow. Okay. I've not heard that story before, sir. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> well, 
come to us, visit Ukraine. Yeah, after, no. after this COVID, we'll take to yeah, different no. places. Exactly. Wow. Well, th that kind of rolls into um, something you had mentioned also before. Um, talk about the underground movement. When I was a student and uh, when I came from the army, you know, we, I was, I was uh, uh, under, uh, in, again, under the influence of the Christian faith and I, 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 uh, I was a Christian and I wanted uh, to preserve at least what could be preserved. Uh, and uh, there was a, a, a society that was called Lion's Society. A lion is an, you know, an animal lion is a symbol of the Western Ukraine and uh, all our old principalities and uh, young men and, and uh, young men and uh, young women have joined uh, together, mostly young men, to make sure that we, we can spread uh, some information. First of all, spread information about atrocities that were made by the communists. We needed to have access to archives and to uh, find uh, those men who uh, were henchmen of the Soviet regime and murdered men like my grandfather. It was also a little bit of personal, uh, but they also murdered a million of others, millions of others, uh, pastors uh, like uh, like uh, the Ukrainian former pastor Fyodor Yerchuk, and uh, and you know they uh, they closed churches, they uh, they destroyed uh, so many human lives, and we wanted to, people to know the truth about those things. So some men had to, had to find uh, some truth in the archives, publish that. Uh, some had to find where they live and uh, come and interview them, ask them, you know, bring them to repentance for what they have done. Uh, and uh, also to make sure that churches are open, you know, make public pressure that uh, churches that were closed, it didn't matter what kind of denomination, but, you know, make a search from uh, from uh, from the society that they are open uh, to make sure that uh, that uh, Christian monuments with crosses uh, would be open and renewed like uh, like a monument in my home village or rather small town to an old uh, Vikings general uh, who died in 1241 and uh, my city my town kept a memory of him by erecting that monument. You know, he fought Mongols and uh, we had this, uh, this uh, brave man stationed uh, for centuries in our hometown. And uh, there was a cross on the top of that monument and the communists took away the cross. And, uh, and uh, you know, we would erect crosses and say, well, it's a proper place to be and uh, publish, uh, publish, uh, some good Christian stories and uh, open churches and preserve Christian heritage. And, uh, and this is all, I mean, just to be clear, I mean, this is all, while communism is alive and strong, I mean, so you guys are at risk constantly for this. Uh, yes, except to remember that, uh, that at that time, Gorbachev began his activities. Okay. And, and uh, it was not, it was not that, uh, that deadly. Yet we, yes, we had, uh, we had, uh, Threats, you know, one day someone you don't know meets you in the street and say, well, we'll hang you, you know, or, uh, or we'll do something to you, what we have done to your grandfather or something like that. And that would happen, you know, like a week, uh, then some, and in another week, someone else would come and make another threat. Some men would, would be broken. You know, we had some, some problems when, when some boys uh, were too weak and uh, then betrayed uh, all organization. But, you know, again, the Lord has spared us. Uh, at that time, no one was put into prison. Uh, we lost our jobs, that's true. But, uh, but otherwise, you know, you, 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 you keep going. Okay. And you know that you stand for the truth. And you know that, uh, that, uh, that uh, without the Lord, uh, the country, uh, would, uh, the nation, the people around you would be lost, uh, not only to communism, but be lost forever and uh, would never have uh, salvation. We need preachers. We need people who can preach the word, and we need uh, we need uh, we need people to lose fear to listen to those people. So that was uh, that was what, what what was done, and uh, like you know another fantastic story, which which sounds like like miracle, but in Rivne, a big city in the western Ukraine, again remember that pressures were built, and people uh, there was a big meeting. Uh, 
a few thousand people got together and for the Soviet Union, that was a very unheard of event. You know, like you have thousands of people in the streets in the communist uh, city. And then, uh, and then uh, the uh, first secretary of the communist party came to that meeting. And what was the demand of the meeting? Open the church, open the, the church in the city, a church. And he said, only through my dead body. That was his answer. Uh, you know, a very proud, arrogant answer. And he left the meeting. The next day, the guy is dead. The church in a few weeks is open. So again, the Lord is working. The Lord is working. But most importantly, he's working through his, through his, through his word, uh, through, uh, the, through the Bible. You, 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 when you and I spoke earlier in the week, um, a phrase you used, uh, we talked about for the sake of the gospel, but you also said for the sake of your country, that for the sake of the people of your country, and you kind of mentioned that now. Um, can you unpack that just a little bit more? Yes, I believe strongly that uh, the country, that country is blessed whose God is the Lord, as it is written in, in the Psalms. And uh, no country can be blessed if the country turns away uh, from the Lord. Ukraine was uh, was damaged by the Soviet uh, Union severely. Ukraine was occupied by the Russian Bolsheviks in 1921. Uh, Eastern Ukraine, Southern Ukraine, uh, Central Ukraine. You know, uh, they made so many atrocities, these godless people. Uh, they have uh, killed uh, our intelligentsia in 1927 through 1937. They organized an artificial famine when all food from Ukrainian farmers was confiscated, uh, when uh, up to seven to 10 million people were starved to death by the godless regime. Why did they uh, make all this uh, evil? Because they hated God, because you know, they never loved the Lord, they hated people. It's, you know, when, when you hear uh, such a history of your nation, and then when, when the, they came to the Western Ukraine, where I am from, and they uh, destroyed half of my family, you know, like they killed, uh, murdered my grandfather and all the intelligentsia in the town. They have sent uh, part, half of my family to Kazakhstan uh, into exile. Uh, they have murdered so many innocent people uh, in the vicinity. Uh, when I was a child, uh, you know, I remember when they when uh, one day I was uh, woken up, I was six years old. My uh, brother Petro, Peter, was 10 years old. My brother Boris was 16 years old. He was uh, already joined the university. And uh, I went into a living room, we were waking up and there was my father sitting in a chair uh, with handcuffs on his uh, hands. And, uh, and there was uh, a man in gray suit standing, his assistant near him. And uh, then he asked my he said, children lined against the wall. We lined against the wall. And he said uh, to my father, who killed your grandfather? And he said, communists did. So he slapped him. My father fell down from his chair. You know, we as children begin to shake. And uh, then, then uh, he says to his assistant, put him back. He put him back and says, who killed your father? And he said, I'll tell you anything. Just take children away. And says, tell to your children, communists killed your father, uh, nationalists killed your father. Those awful Christians, you know. And my father said, okay, okay, they killed my, my father. And the guy turned to us and said, I am Captain Rakov, KGB. Remember this. And never say that communists are bad people, never in your life. So I did remember that very well. And I knew that should be changed one day. And the only thing that, that could change that uh, would be a Christian faith because nothing changes human hearts except the word of God. Nothing mm -hmm. turns, you know, we still remain sinners as Luther said, similar uses at Pekater, but people are different. And for the sake of any nation, not only Ukrainian nation, the word of God should be, should be preached. Amen. And uh, Amen. I think sometime in that time, in that uh, time of period of my life, I vowed that I'll do my best to make sure the word of God is preached and restored back to my nation. Wow. A amen and amen. So, so for the sake of time, and we could go on and on here, obviously, but for the sake of time right now, um, uh, so God did. Um, the communism fell. And, and so mm. thanks be to God. And how did that affect what you were doing? And then kind of roll into how did LHF, how were we able to help for the Ukrainian people after the fall of communism? 
Well, you know, the, uh, the uh, fellow communism uh, helped me to get my Ukrainian Bible first. <laughs> I was gonna say. Remember, remember, for many years, I was using my English Bible. Uh, I got married and uh, I read my Bible, my English Bible to my wife. I was translating from English into Ukrainian to make sure that she would hear the word, uh, the word of God because she came from a communist family. She never heard uh, the Bible. And wow. uh, for me, that was that was uh, emergency. And to find the Ukrainian Bible. My uh, grandfather, by that time, he has died. The Bible was confiscated by my cousin, you know, and he married and he moved into another city. And uh, I got my English Bible. And then, and then I found this Bible, my first Ukrainian Bible. Uh, it, it was, uh, it was uh, an excellent resource and uh, I was reading it daily. And, uh, and uh, you know, the Bible, the Bible, uh, I was going to the Eastern Orthodox Church at the time, and the Bible has uh, made me to wonder what was happening at church. Remember, I love the Word of God. I, right. But when I heard uh, sermons and when I heard uh, calls to pray to the saints uh, and to Virgin Mary, and uh, the motto that Virgin Mary is the Savior of the world, I was, uh, I was, uh, I didn't feel comfortable. When uh, some of the Pentecostals have heard that I have uh, doubts, because I was speaking about that publicly, <laughs> uh, they came to me and said that I was their man. But remember, I was a linguist, and uh, I, I could not, uh, I could not uh, understand their logic of the tongue speaking, because to me it was absolutely clear that uh, that it was the new languages, the real languages that uh, that uh, the. Lord Holy Spirit gave uh, apostles possibility to talk and to speak, to preach in uh, languages. And uh, Baptists uh, had the same result. You know, I was a baptized child of God in my, in my childhood. And, uh, you know, I was, I was lost uh, in my thoughts. I, I, you know, I had my father confessor, Volodymyr Yatskiv. I already moved to Ternopil to teach at the university there. And, and he was on my side, but he couldn't explain many things himself because he was an Orthodox priest. He was a good priest. He was persecuted for his faith in the Soviet times. In time of Khrushchev, he was, uh, he was an excellent man, but he couldn't give, couldn't give me answers. And then, uh, then, uh, then uh, my uh, uh, head of the department, chair head of the university, told me one day, Slavic, uh, some Lutherans came into the city. Would you like to go? Because you talk about Christ all the time and about problems at church. And uh, that's, you know, that, uh, that uh, it's something's wrong with the message. And uh, so maybe they will answer uh, your problems. So we went to a meeting. There were three ELS guys sitting at the meeting. And it was in another university. And I think I was the only one who was uh, standing up and asking question after question. And boy, I realized these, these people, they are, you know, they love the word of God. They know it so well. They are liturgical church. You know, they value the holy baptism. They, they, uh, they uh, do uh, believe uh, that the holy communion, in the holy communion, you have real presence of Christ, body and blood, you know, and it's given to the salvation, uh, to the forgiveness of your sins, salvation, eternal life. And it should be practiced uh, as often as possible. And I thought, you know, well, that, that's the biblical church. These guys, you know, are sent by God. <laughs> and I and I, I just I just said you know I uh, can I can I talk with you? I said absolutely, and uh, and then they left me a copy of Luther's Small Catechism. <laughs> when I read Luther's Small Catechism, I realized I was Lutheran long ago, you know, <laughs> because I read the Bible. And this is what I tell to other people: if you treat your Bible seriously, uh, you sooner or later you'll become a Lutheran. Uh, and Luther's Small Catechism is of a big assistance. To this uh, uh, in, in this truth and then and then uh, with the uh, help of God we found uh, you know the a congregation in Ternopil in 1994 I was uh, I visited uh, uh, Concordia Theological Seminary in St. Louis for summer classes and then I met uh, uh, Pastor Robert Run and uh, and uh, I, I also met some of my Latvian friends and they shared with me some books in Latvian. I said, oh boy, can we have such books in Ukrainian? And say, well, you know, this guy, this, this, uh, this Bob Ran, he's a very good pastor and he, he can help you, absolutely. So I, I said, when will he be there? I said, well, sometime, someday, someday soon. 
So Pastor Ran came and I asked him, can we, can we talk? He said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Ukraine. Can we have some, some things in Ukrainian, please? I said, absolutely. Let's try with the good news about Jesus. And, and uh, he provided some money and we made the translation. And then small catechism. And, uh, and uh, we have an expression, Ukrainian, taken away like hot pies, you know, uh, some tasty, some you, you cannot, you cannot uh, print enough because it was taken away so quickly. And uh, it helped uh, to build uh, our church body so quickly because people were thirsty for the word of God even more. Uh, I'll tell you one story, if you don't mind, no. just one, one more story about small catechism. <laughs> Again, our confessions are very powerful and the Lutheran Heritage Foundation made an excellent, excellent thing to restore Lutheranism in Ukraine, to bring people back, not only to the Christian uh, faith, but also to confession of this Christian faith in the pure, uh, pure biblical way. Uh, a story, one story from, from uh, our church. Uh, we, uh, you know, I, we had, uh, we had uh, our pastor in uh, Zaporizhia, in the southeast of Ukraine, and he called me one day, he said, I had a call from a Baptist uh, pastor, and he said he uh, got hold of our small catechism and read it and asked whether I could come and talk more about this. I said, absolutely, just go and uh, bring with yourself Taylor's explanations of uh, Luther's catechism, bring other books that we publish, and by that time, I think we published already about 10 books. And uh, that was a very good resource. He came to the congregation. He uh, delivered uh, to each person small catechism. Uh, they talked about that. And then he said, they invite me to come again. And uh, pretty soon, this congregation announced a Baptist congregation that they are moving to the Lutheran church. And now they're very good, solid uh, Lutheran, uh, Lutheran congregation uh, in, our, in our church. And it's interesting, it's interesting, you know, observation of this uh, pastor. He says, he says, so many people are ignorant, ignorant about the biblical truth uh, uh, that the Lutherans uh, preach. And he said, when, when, they, when they come and when you have an intelligent person, when you have a believer and he comes across such a resource, he, he will not resist because the Holy Spirit works through the word. Through the word. And, uh, and the Lutheran Heritage Foundation gives exactly this resource, uh, resource into so many, so many hands. Excellent. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Jen here. Um, and this is beautiful, Reverend Horpacek. We can't tell you how awesome this is. Um, but I know we have some questions, but I'd also like, while, while Jen, you're getting ready, um, I, I did a quick look that I think to date, we've done 69 different publications now in the Ukrainian language. So, so what started, you know, uh, 20, 25 years ago, um, now we have all these other books for, for you all to grow and to share the faith. And we can go on that to, at another Zoom. But Jen, why don't you hop into your, uh, your questions? Yeah, I have quite a few here, actually. So buckle up, Pastor. <laughs> Um, first of all, Ruben asked um, just kind of some basic information for us. Could you tell us um, just briefly a little bit about the Ukrainian Lutheran Church, um, how many churches, how many pastors you have, do you have deacons, deaconesses, um, any Lutheran schools, just kind of a, a brief picture of what um, the Ukrainian Lutheran Church is like. We are not a big uh, church body, we have uh, around 20 congregations, and we have uh, also a number of missions uh, in uh, different parts of Ukraine. We have 15 pastors. We, we do lack pastors, we need more pastors. We have uh, about 10, uh, we have uh, three acting deacons uh, and deacons, uh, they help a church. And we have about 10 deaconesses also in our church who help us and who uh, work with children and who work with the needy and uh, who uh, try to uh, spread the word uh, around, uh, the word of Christ around. And also, uh, we, uh, we uh, have our publications, uh, the banner, and we also try to sh we share our books that are, published, uh, that are published by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation with other uh, Lutheran church bodies. They, they are also not big, but, uh, but they are present in Ukraine. That's uh, German Evangelical Lutheran Church. We have two German Evangelical Lutheran churches. They are split. And we have... Uh, we have uh, 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 self or self uh, self support uh, not self -support, independent uh, evangel uh, evangelical Lutheran church. Okay. In Ukraine. 
Very good. Uh, another question that they um, I have here is um, in, in regard to LHF, so the books that you were mentioning that LHF has assisted with in Ukraine, uh, the question of why books were tech driven society, but from your experience, why is it still important to have those printed materials? Uh, you know, the print materials are important because, uh, you know, like uh, St. Saint, uh, Saint Paul said, how will they believe if they don't hear? The question is, how will they remember if they don't read? And uh, and yes, now we, right now we live in a, in a digital digitalized society. Uh, and yet, uh, I think we all remember a Ray Bradbury uh, novel. Uh, what's, the, what's the name? 450 or so, Fahrenheit. Uh, Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, and uh, and uh, we remember that uh, that print materials, yes, they can be burned. Yes, they can be confiscated. Uh, but uh, but they will uh, not be scrambled like like any electronic device can be scrambled. Uh, they are, they are of importance uh, to have them in a form in a way that they will always be handy and available available uh, to a person. Uh, I like that you I like that you use the word handy because I can just imagine somebody handing a book to somebody else versus you can't do that with technology. You have to tell them to go look it up. But I mean, you can point them right onto a page in a book and say, "Look, it's here. Let's read this together." Absolutely. Remember that, uh, for example, uh, Lutheran churches were exterminated in Ukraine. Absolutely. Uh, there was no Lutheranism allowed in the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Lutherans were to some extent allowed in Latvia. They were to some extent uh, allowed uh, in, uh, I think in, uh, in uh, Lithuania and Estonia. But in Ukraine, it was forbidden. It was labeled as Nazi. And if you're Lutheran, you are 100% immediately Nazi. Doesn't matter your nationality, German, Ukrainian, uh, you're Nazi. And, uh, and uh, all of our pastors were uh, sent into exiles or were murdered. Uh, some were able, some uh, were able to, to escape uh, to Germany or to America. Uh, so when you look at, uh, at people in the Lutheran churches in Ukraine today, most of them are uh, new to the Lutheran faith. New to the Lutheran faith and uh, books are probably one of the most uh, prominent instrument that brought them and also that kept them faithful because that's another thing that uh, keeps uh, a person faithful to the Lutheran uh, denomination, you know, the books, because it's always bringing back the knowledge of your Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, and those precious truths that we have in the Bible. Amen. Well said. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jen. That's okay. <laughs> um, piggybacking on that question, then, if you only could keep three books, what three books would you keep? Oh, God forbid. <laughs> I see your shelves behind you. Yeah, it might be a hard yes. choice. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, I think I think uh, uh, the Bible, of course. You know, uh, if the Bible is included, I would say uh, the Book of Concord would be uh, number two. And uh, I would say Luther's Lectures on Galatians. <laughs> That'd really? be my choice. I have to smile, and uh, 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 Slavic, you and I, you and I talked earlier in the week, and one of the things we talked about was Luther's works. And my mind immediately went to his lecture on Galatians, and that that is one of my English go-to's. I would never give that up. And and for those of you, whether you're a pastor or a, a lay person, it's very readable um, in the English, and and Luther is just beautiful in that. Um, but we have done Galatians in. Um, uh, Luther's lectures on Galatians in the Ukrainian language for the people there. That's that's beautiful. Yes, you know, today I uh, uh, three days ago I got a message from from Andrei Tolstoy. It like, sounds like Russian author uh, from, but he lives in Lviv, and he uh, he asked me whether he he's my became a Facebook friend and said, "Do you really have uh, Luther works in Ukrainian?" I said, "Well, we we have not all volumes because uh, because uh, they are popular." So could you send them to me? And then, uh, then uh, in a few days, uh, he responds to me. Today, actually, I got a letter and a, a picture with books on his table, three volumes of Luther, and said, "Do you have a church? There's excellent, excellent works, uh, uh, so easily read, and Luther is such a genius. Do you have a church in my town?" I said, "No, not right now." I said, "When are you coming?" <laughs> so that's, 
<laughs> again, that, 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 that's how that's how Lutheran uh, Luther Heritage Foundation uh, books uh, work, and Luther Luther is of absolute importance. Yeah, you know we need good commentaries. Uh, we need good commentaries. We worked on people Bibles commentaries, but Luther is the best. Absolutely, Luther yeah. is the best. Never <laughs> trade Luther for anyone. <laughs> Sorry, Jen. He and I could talk all day. Quick, interrupt us. Sorry, yes. I am. I'm going to interrupt you right now because um, it actually does relate to what you were just saying in terms of um, being contacted and saying, do you have a Lutheran church here? Um, another question that Ruben had is, is the Ukrainian Lutheran church growing these days or is it um, kind of like over the past five years, has it roughly stayed the same or are you kind of reaching a period now where you're losing members um, due to secularism or death? We, it's a very good question because we have lost a few congregations due to war in Ukraine. Uh, for example, I was a missionary uh, in the Crimea in 1996 and the Lord has blessed us uh, that uh, I, you know, the Lord has uh, established the congregation in uh, Sevastopol and then the second congregation was established in, uh, in Simferopol. Then more congregations were added now, uh, because Russia attacked Ukraine, we lost those uh, those churches. Uh, we lost uh, churches in the eastern Ukraine, where Russia has occupied uh, uh, parts of our territories. Uh, as for numbers, uh, I think uh, we had a period when we got uh, into sort of stagnation. Uh, it, it began when war began, because it was it was like uh, when you go into the street and try to talk to people, you know, they are not willing to talk to you. It's like everyone is a hostile to each other, even worse than it was in the Soviet Union. But now, uh, but now uh, we began to gain some members again. So I would say that uh, that we are on a very slow going up, going up. And uh, frankly speaking, COVID has helped. <laughs> really? Explain. Ah, uh, because I think I think we you know we were sort of uh, this war has uh, made us. Uh, also, stagnant uh, of uh, of uh, uncertainty. You know, what do you do? You know, how do you reach reach out to people? It's it's like, you know, it's this type of uncertainty. It 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 sort of paralyzes uh, many people. Uh, but uh, COVID has uh, has made us to use uh, the same technology as you do, Zoom. You know, daily devotions on uh, uh, on the internet, uh, more catechisms classes, uh, and then. And then you have you have more and more people saying, "Okay, we would like to join your class, and we would like to join your class." And uh, <laughs> now in our congregation, we have basically uh, uh, basically classes lasting all year round, and confirmations are coming, and weddings uh, coming, and it's you know I think all th as uh, as it is written, all things uh, uh, work for good to those who love the Lord. Amen, mm -hmm. Ryan. Um, I, but I, I could, I, again, all these things we could talk for hours on, but I want to cover as many questions as we can. Uh, I thought this was a really good, insightful question from Sonia, who asked, it sounds like you have experienced many of the evils of the world firsthand. Given these experiences, how do you still love your enemies? I think uh, with Christian faith, you know, the Lord, uh, the Lord uh, give us the strength and uh, we cannot do uh, otherwise. It's, it's not me, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, the Lord that, that lives in me. And we all, we can do all things through Christ who lives in me. You know, I made my attempt about 10, 10 years ago to find uh, Captain Rakov from the KGB who lined us, my family against the wall. And uh, when I, uh, found the building that he worked and I found his colleague. I wanted to only to see him and say and say him and remind him, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed. They were sure that the Soviet Union would live long and the Christians would be exterminated, that no one would uh, speak the name of Christ. But I wanted to ask him how it worked, you know, and ask him, invite him to, 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 to church. But he died, unfortunately. You know, and this guy told me, uh, he, he said he was evil man and said, did you meet him? And said, I did. He said, well, he was even an evil man, he's dead. Uh, I think, I think uh, you know, uh, when we have, uh, when we desire to vengeance, then something is wrong with us. 
I believe, uh, I believe uh, the Lord Holy Spirit changes people. And that's why, that's why we need more gospel, more gospel in Ukraine. Because only through the gospel, the Holy Spirit creates the same faith. And only through his, you know, through the Holy Spirit, through, because of faith, we can love the Lord and we can love uh, other people. Without the Holy Spirit, that's impossible. And when, when that faith is present, when you have the Christian faith, then whether you want or not, you know, the flesh probably will resist, but you'll always run to do good and, and to, show, to, show, to show the love. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do you, uh, we had another question that someone asked, do you believe that our world could see religious persecution arise again to the same scale as it did in the former Soviet Union? Do you, um, based on your experience in life, do you see any signs of this in our world today? I believe we can come to that very quickly, uh, especially if, uh, we lose our freedom of confession and if we are passive and we, if we don't talk. Uh, because uh, in Ukraine, we have uh, big attacks now from, uh, from the uh, LGBT societies, for example, where they want us to be silent about, uh, about uh, sins, certain sin, sins, and they want to have a legislature that would punish us for preaching the truth, saying the truth. And also, there is a big, big attack from the mass media. Uh, unfortunately, they're not run by Christians. And uh, they, uh, it looks like they hate uh, uh, Christianity. And they always misrepresent Christianity. Uh, and uh, what, I, uh, what I see is, uh, is uh, growing uh, return basically to, to paganism. You know, like uh, when I look at uh, what's, what's happening in uh, Europe, uh, in the European Union, what I look, and they are very the biggest neighbor uh, in the West and South of Ukraine, South uh, West of Ukraine. When I look at Ukraine, I, I see uh, paganism at its, at its worst, that gaining, uh, gaining power. Uh, so we should be ready. But again, if we have the word of God, uh, remember, Almighty Fortress, our God. <laughs> they won't. They won't prevail. We'll stand on the word. Yes. Amen. Um, it's uh, another uh, question. I guess kind of relate. Uh, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm skipping ahead because you just uh, because of your quote from uh, a mighty fortress. Uh, another question was: Do you have certain Bible verses or hymns that you turn to? when you're fearful or needing courage? Well, it's, uh, I think, uh, uh, I think uh, most, of, most of all would be Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Mm -hmm. And when I had my hardest time in my life, uh, dark hours, when you don't know what would happen next, uh, whether you survive or not. Uh, so that was, was a very good thing. And uh, also, also, uh, the Lord, uh, you know, our Almighty Fortress, our God, from the hymns, uh, and uh, uh, some uh, some that I raise my eyes to the heights where my help will come. My help comes from the Lord who created heaven and earth. So that's these are things that I I think I I speak most uh, often when uh, when i have troubles and to the words of the lord when he says don't be afraid uh, little flock mm -hmm. in ukraine we are a little flock remember that all other denominations in ukraine were penetrated by kgb and were allowed lutherans were not allowed lutherans were exterminated so we are still a very big my very it's it's a consumer on probably big minority <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but but we are i understand wow. what you're saying yes also, you have put us English-speaking Americans to shame when you have scripture memorized not only in Ukrainian but also in English. We need to get busy. <laughs> um, where did I see? Okay, sorry. Um, Joanne wanted to know: Are schools in Ukraine allowed to teach about Jesus? And if so, how is that done? I'm assuming she must mean the public school system. Uh, the public schools. Uh could teach some Christian ethics till recently. 
uh, some public schools can still do it. In some public schools, uh, some prayers are allowed in Ukraine, uh, but that happened after our latest revolution. Remember, we had three revolutions in uh, 15 years. And uh, uh, during the latest revolution that was called the Revolution of Dignity, when we had a dict basically a man who wanted to become a dictator and, uh, and force Ukraine into the union with Russia and the Ukrainian nation wanted a union with the European Union and NATO. Uh, then after that revolution, uh, the government, the parliament finally adopted the law that allowed establishment of Christian day schools. And uh, big uh, churches, those who have uh, uh, big numbers of people and more money, uh, they have established already a few uh, Christian day schools. And by the way, uh, Ukraine has also uh, has also uh, established a university in fellowship with the Concordia University uh, in Wisconsin. Oh, I didn't know that. That's really that's really interesting. And so, have you? Is that? Um, do you have many? How do, How does it work? Is it an academic exchange, or uh, do you actually travel? Do you have students who travel in exchange, or is it an exchange of teachers? I think uh, that's exchange of teachers. Some some students uh, made exchange before COVID. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> and uh, and some uh, it, it just uh, that uh, that was established shortly before COVID uh, struck out. I was even elected the 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 president of this of the how do you call this uh, this board supervisory board. <laughs> yeah. Well, but that's never... given us something more to learn about to go find yeah. out more about. I didn't know about that. So. Um, let's see, um, Anna had the question, has the push toward a return to communism in recent times in Ukraine put any new pressure or additional pressure on your churches? Uh, well, Ukraine uh, Ukraine was not really pushed back to communism, if I Is understand. It, I wonder if they're maybe speaking uh, in terms of the influence of Russia. Uh, no, there was no uh, big uh, pressure from the government. In fact, uh, the, the pressure was growing when Russia was uh, having more ties with Ukraine. Uh, when, uh, before the war, before the revolution, when uh, Russians uh, had more influence upon Ukraine, for example, we were kicked out of our building several times of rent facilities because we were uh, looked as a church that has uh, American connections, that has a uh, Nazi past. Although again, you know, it's, we were not Nazis. It's, it's, just, it's just, just this stigma that they try to, uh, to uh, pronounce upon, upon Lutherans uh, around Ukraine. And uh, also, uh, and also uh, we had some, uh, some cases when they tried to scare some of pastors from preaching the word of God. But when, uh, when uh, the latest revolution happened, uh, when Ukraine chose uh, the way to go into the EU and to NATO, uh, those things stopped. We did have, however, some, some pressure from local businesses connected with the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, you know, they wanted to take a land, for example, from church in Kyiv. And because many government officials are members of the church, they don't want to react to that. So. Uh, they cut away our water supply, from, for example, from the church. Two years, so you understand, we'll live without, uh, without any running water. Thanks be to God, we have engineers in our congregation who have developed a system when we pump in uh, like three tons of water and we have, uh, they have developed a system of uh, pumps and uh, it's all working fine. But uh, finally, the government uh, interfered and uh, we, uh, you know, we are putting pipes uh, on the property and uh, the water supply will be restored. It's a very difficult process. Wow. So that has been a long time, two years of that. Yes, yes. Wow. you know, that, that was that question is such a good question because that, it, again, it's a communist mentality. When you have someone as a communist mentality, they want to, uh, you know, hold you and, uh, and control you absolutely. And uh, they want you to be obedient up to the smallest letter in uh, in the, uh, in their communist code in some place uh, in the dark uh, alleys of their heads. And, uh, and you know, they're, they're vengeful people. 
And uh, this mentality is still present in Ukraine. And again, only the Lord can change it. Only the preaching of the gospel can change it. When we have all these all these challenges, we understand that uh, you know I always remember as Apostle John says, this world lies in evil, and we should not be surprised if such things happen. Uh, we sh- but also we should not be afraid, and we should not despair. Well, it's it's fine, you know, it's a normal way of things. Uh, and uh, if the Lord allows us such things, he, he, evil rulers, local rulers, or whatever, uh, you know, He wants us to make stronger. It's just we just look at history of the church of the early church. Why we have this uh, this pantheon of martyrs, uh, you know, of whom I think Tertullian said that that uh, blood of martyrs uh, uh, is a seed uh, of the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, we know we know uh, the Holy Spirit raised the faith, but example of those people who died for their faith, who suffered, who stand firm for the truth of the church. Take Luther, you know, next year, 1521, when he took his position at Worms. And said, "Here I stand," and we should. It it it, it encourages, yes. and as uh, it's written in the Hebrews, if you have such a cloud of uh, witnesses, you know, we just we just follow them, we follow their example. Yeah. Wow. Um, I I. I... I, I think all of us probably agree that we could just go on and on. And I, I still have a couple of questions here that I would like to squeeze in. But um, I wanted to let our participants know we've been thinking that we might also like to have a second Zoom section with Reverend Horpinchuk um, to discuss what he sort of alluded to a couple of times here, which is um, the unique position of the church and of being a pastor during a wartime situation, such as. Um, what Ukraine is facing with Russia on many fronts right now. And so stay tuned for that. Um, Some of their questions uh, we're just not going to get to, but I think it would fit well, actually, in that next session. And so we will um, do that. In the meantime, just very briefly, um, Larry had wanted to know how our current relations between your church body and the D-E-L-K-U and the S-E-L-C-U. I'm guessing those must be other Lutheran church bodies in Ukraine. Okay. Um, so what are the current relations between um, your church body and theirs? And do you coordinate the distribution of LHF materials in the Ukrainian language to these other Lutheran groups? Yes. Oh, well, we, we have uh, what I call uh, working relations. Mm-hmm. We communicate, uh, write to each other to pastors communicate with each other. And uh, we, uh, whenever we have a book published, we always inform uh, other church uh, bodies and uh, ask them how many books do they need and we send them very quickly. For example, just recently we have published, uh, we have published uh, uh, commentaries on the uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, it, it's the, the, the most fresh book. And uh, we will be mailing that soon to other Lutheran church bodies, both in the Ukraine Lutheran church, to the congregation in the ULC, and also to the congregations in uh, Telco. So if, they, if anyone uh, wants to have a book, they will have it. We have enough of books. We want everyone to have them. And we are ready to send them to all people around. And again, we have enough, enough, enough books uh, so, uh, so that we are so happy to share. Okay, um, and I think uh, the question then that we will go ahead and wrap up with then is again reflecting on um, the challenges faced not only by you but by your fellow Ukrainians as you went through this time of persecution and in some ways still um, continue to experience that persecution. Um, this person wanted to know, is it possible for the church to grow during times of persecution, or do we just hope to maintain? Are there blessings that can come out of a time like this? I am convinced we can grow. I'm absolutely convinced we can grow. And uh, when, uh, when uh, we look at the time of persecution in the Soviet Union, the church was strong. People wanted to hear the word of God. And when persecutions happen, uh, many people become stronger in their faith. And we, we, you know, we should not forget that the Lord uh, allows such things to happen, and He stands with His church. And if He if He allows such things, He has His plan that that we should not be again. We should not be afraid. Remember what happened from the persecution in the in uh, Jerusalem. 
uh, you know, spread of the gospel, not uh, only in Judea, uh, Samaria, but, uh, but in Europe. <laughs> Macedonia call for Paul. Uh, and again, many people uh, are willing to hear answers. If it's, you know, when you have, when you have a, a persecution of any type, a uh, question of justice appears also. And why? The question, big why? And justice and why is the vessel answered in the Bible, in the word of God? So we, we, we can grow and we will grow. Wonderful words to end on. Thank you. <laughs> um, Rod, I'll hand it back over to you then to kind of close us out here. Almighty everlasting God, first and always, we thank you for the gift of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit acting in our lives. We thank you for your work to move us to believe. And we thank you for the fact that we have your word to inform us and that you have gathered us together as your children. Almighty God, thank you for keeping Reverend Horpincheck through all the events of his life, for raising him up and keeping him strong in that faith and keeping him strong also in his body so that he could be an advocate to share that good news for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the Ukrainian people. Almighty God, thank you for Lutheran Heritage Foundation and all other organizations that are actively trying to get the gospel out there to all people. Heavenly Father, we are entering a world of persecution. You promised that that would happen. Help us to accept it, not resign ourselves to it, but accept it and still actively be your children as we live in that world, not being afraid, but knowing that you are our God and that you are guiding us as Lord and Shepherd. Almighty God, I pray that you bless all of our hearers that are online with us today and just keep them safe and their families. Almighty God, thank you for every single good gift, but most importantly, the gift of your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray all things in his name. Amen. Thank you, sir. Wonderful talking with you. And like Jen said, we, we will get back and do the rest of the story, maybe five or 10 sessions like this. <laughs> I'm both, oh, always happy. And thank you very much for your hard work in the kingdom and for your support and for your love to the people of God around the world so that they may know Christ and may have the precious word of God printed and kept close to their heart. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank thank you. you for inspiring us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the day. Sleep well, Good sir. Yes, yeah, sleep well. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Blessings in the day. Bye.